Hello CIO world and welcome to another installment of chemical engineering design. In this lecture we will go over boiling and condensing. Uh, we will have a look at uh, the difference between boiling versus evaporation uh, just so that we are clear on what we mean by boiling and also look at various forms of boiling that can occur uh, in industry and also how to go about um, you know, the various energy calculations that um, are used for condensing applications. Okay, so boiling and condensing are slightly different obviously, um, but as processes for chemical engineering processes, um, the way that we approach condensing obviously is going to be different to the way that we approach boiling. Some very interesting considerations for boiling uh, that we will be going over. And then uh, we will also go into more detail with regards to, you know, um, condensation. All right. So uh, here we uh, look at the, you know, two sort of cases uh, of of boiling uh, that you get. Um, on the left hand side, we have the gas forming out of its liquid at the bottom of the surface. Um, this is a flat surface and then on the right hand side uh, is the same system uh, but with some uh, actuation uh, to help the development of bubbles. You've probably heard of the word uh, nucleation. So uh, as the bubble forms it has to push um, against the liquid surrounding itself. So you can think of you blowing a, a balloon, filling it with air. You require some pressure to push against the uh, the elastic rubber, all right, and then um, on the right hand side uh, there are some pits or some surface uh, changes that help to initiate uh, boiling. Okay, boiling is similar to evaporation in that a liquid um, obviously transitions into its gaseous phase. But there are uh, distinctions that are made between these two phenomena. So firstly evaporation occurs at the gas-liquid interface when the liquid's vapor pressure is below the saturation pressure and no bubbles of the liquid form within the liquid, uh, of the gas I mean. So no bubbles are present in the gas, uh, in, the, in the liquid. Um, it's at the liquid gas um, interface that the evaporation occurs probably because the air is is below the saturation level uh, of the maximum water vapor that it can acquire or that it can hold so there's a certain capacity that air in the atmosphere can hold and that's also dependent on the temperature so the hotter the air gets the more liquid it can hold and this is the big problem with greenhouse gas emissions um, where uh, the higher the temperature of the atmosphere, the more liquid vapor the atmosphere can hold. And water is uh, a very powerful greenhouse gas, much more than CO2. And so as a greenhouse gas, water will absorb more energy, heat up the atmosphere more, the atmosphere can absorb more water, and so forth and so on. And eventually you can have a runaway where the Earth will become like Venus, with lots of gas, very hot, 300 degrees Celsius, um, and yeah, so th that has to do with uh, evaporation. Now, boiling, on the other hand, uh, occurs uh, under different uh, conditions, and obviously will require a hot surface below. So, um, energy transfer to the liquid, um, you know, allows the liquid to reach a saturation pressure, so that bubbles will start to form at the solid liquid interface where the heat is being added. Obviously it, it doesn't have to be um, you know at the base it can be around the um, around the tube or you know around the pipe or whatever um, uh, depending on where the energy is coming from. All right. Um, and in any case uh, this means that there will be um, you know, so um, at the solid liquid interface, the temperature needs to be above the saturation uh, temperature, obviously, uh, for the heat to be transferred. There must be a temperature gradient, right? 
um, because the molecules are using this energy as latent heat. Okay, so the temperature isn't going to change uh, between um, you know the the latent heat transfer mechanism. So uh, the liquid therefore would have to be at a temperature that's slightly higher than a saturation temperature. So this will mean that there um, you know, will be what is known as an excess temperature as, uh, as we measure this relative to the saturation temperature. So let's say the water is boiling at 105 degrees, then the excess temperature in this case will be 5 degrees, 5 degrees above saturation temperature. Uh, we use this to determine uh, obviously how much energy is going into boiling the liquid and uh, is considered in, in conjunction with the heat of vaporization. Now uh, boiling may occur on a, you know, a for a stationary liquid inside a tank for instance um, which is referred to as pool boiling. Okay, so uh, here I show you typical pool boiling. We add energy as Q dot and um, the temperature of the surface minus temperature saturation. So the temperature of that surface that is being heated. Um, this temperature difference gives us T excess. Okay, so let's quickly talk about pool pool boiling. Pool boiling happens inside a tank, obviously. Uh, but as chemical engineers, we work with continuous processes. So there's another type of thing uh, called flow boiling. So uh, for a flowing fluid within a pipe, um, we boil the liquid. How do we do this? We do it in a, a heat exchanger. We exchange heat from maybe one fluid to another. So maybe there's another fluid surrounding this pipe. Uh, that's doing the heating. Maybe it's with coils, um, electrical coils, maybe it's a, a, a furnace, a gas uh, that's doing the heating or radiative heating is doing uh, the job for us. Um, there's also a phenomenon called um, subboiling um, uh, to consider as well. So uh, we've discussed the excess temperature. Okay, so with subboiling, um, this may occur. Okay, so boiling occurs at the base, but evaporation still occurs at the liquid gas interface because the the liquid gas interface, that temperature right there, is below the saturation point. So in this case, it will be 80 degrees, 90 degrees. So you'll see steam leaving. You'll see bubbles for forming at the. So watch when you're boiling a pot of water, for example, you'll see the bubbles forming at the base. Um, now this is in contrast to what is known as saturated boiling where the liquid solid interface is at the saturation temperature for that liquid. Now as you can see boiling is not a simple process at all. There are temperature gradients that, in, that are involved. There are many stages um, that are involved uh, in terms of boiling. You can have um, very slow boiling, you can have very vigorous boiling the most obvious way we categorize boiling is um, by the following type. So the first is referred to as boiling by natural convection. There's convection in the liquid that helps with heat transfer. There must be a temperature gradient, otherwise tem uh, the heat won't be transferred to the liquid, obviously. And um, this natural convection type boiling is characterized by a subcooled liquid gas interface. Now the second type of boiling is known as nucleate boiling where the liquid gas interface has reached the saturation temperature of 100 degrees for water in this case. Obviously we can work with other liquids like acetone or ethanol um, and then the, the temperature, saturation temperature of all those liquids are lower. Isolated bubbles will also form, visibly form, at the solid liquid interface and migrate up to the surface before they burst uh, into a vapor, into the gaseous medium. The solid liquid interface is, in this case, obviously superheated. Okay, so um, the water there will be above the saturation temperature. The third type is known as transition boiling, where pockets of vapor begin to form along the solid liquid interface which is um, now obviously well above saturation temperature of that liquid. 
Now convection is much more vigorous as well. You've got a lot of um, swelling up of the, the bubbling fluid with lots of bubbles mixing the liquid. Now the final phase of boiling is referred to as film boiling um, due to the typical film that actually uh, you know forms. It's a, it's a vapor that forms continuously at the solid liquid interface which is much hotter than the saturation temperature for the fluid. The following clip shows the temperature distribution for a boiling pot. So this shows you that there is this temperature gradient that I've been talking about, so I'm not lying to you. Um, there must be this temperature gradient, otherwise there won't be heat transfer. Remember, that is the driving force. Now notice the difference between the saturation temperature in green and the superheated temperature in the orange for the pot. So to summarize, the types of boiling that can occur are typically characterized uh, by the development of um, well, the development and nature of the, the vapor which is forming um, and obviously leaving uh, its liquid. Um, now consider the differences in heat transfer which will take place as a result okay and also um, as a result of more vapor being present how is heat transfer being affected uh, for example for film boiling at the source of heat what is happening and how is nucleate boiling more efficient um, in terms of heat transfer than film boiling is it more um, efficient is it less efficient which type of boiling would you consider is preferred um, for use in industry okay so these are very important questions um, it's design questions if you're in industry um, you know and you see these different types of boiling uh, regimes uh, you know understand what the implications are so to answer these questions it is helpful to consider uh, the following plot which is referred to as a boiling curve uh, with heat of boiling plotted on the y-axis and the excess temperature delta T excess is plotted against the x-axis. Now let's first discuss uh, the extreme cases of film boiling. Okay, What happens during film boiling is that the liquid is elevated upwards by a continuous vapor pocket that cushions the liquid from the solid interface. So consider the differences in thermal conductivities that arise between the liquid and the gas in this case and how heat transfer is affected. Okay, so you can see um, us starting to answer that first question that I had in terms of film boiling. How is heat transfer um, you know, uh, influenced by this phenomenon? Let's now quickly return to our boiling curve again. The boiling curve is defined by distinct regions of boiling. Region 1 is typically of the subcooled or natural convection type boiling. Isolated bubbles appear at the surface of the solid liquid interface and if delta T excess is very large the liquid gas interface reached um, uh, interface uh, reaches the uh, saturation temperature and nucleate uh, boiling will commence thereafter. So for water, delta T excess is around 5 to 10 degrees. Region 2 is defined by the onset of more vigorous bubble formation and visible vapor present um, above the surface at the liquid gas interface. So you should see a lot of steam coming off. Uh, now at some critical uh, delta T excess, here you see there's a maximum heat flux which is achieved. For water in this case, it's going to be around 1 megawatt per meter squared of, sur of surface area. And an excess temperature of about 30 degrees, more or less, uh, is where you will reach this delta T. Now of course, uh, this also defend, uh, d depends on the surface morphology, the roughness, how easy is it to nucleate bubbles, uh, to form bubbles, etc. Okay, but more or less 30 degrees Celsius is the magic number. Um, at this critical heat flux, 
uh, we obtain the highest possible convective heat transfer coefficient before the onset of film boiling. And for water in this case, this is about 33,000 watt per meter squared Kelvin. Okay, so understand how we get to this number and why we reach a maximum for this um, for this case. Okay, um, of all the boiling types, nucleate boiling is going to obviously be the preferred choice due to this very high um, effective uh, convective heat transfer coefficient. Okay. Hereafter, we commence with what is known as transition boiling, which is actually very difficult to achieve, and we will see why shortly. Since larger uh, bubbles and pockets of vapor now shield the solid interface from the liquid, there is a decrease in the convective heat transfer coefficient, since this vapor um, has not only a lower convective heat transfer coefficient compared to the liquid, but uh, it also has very low thermal conductivity relative to the liquid. Remember there's a um, at the solid liquid interface there's not going to be uh, much convection uh, you're first going to have thermal conductivity playing a role and then convective heat transfer uh, playing a role. So what does this lowered convective heat transfer coefficient mean? Less heat is being transferred to the liquid. However this does not mean that there is less heat available from the solid surface. In fact, uh, if not, you know, if if this heat is not being transferred right away from the solid surface, or it's not effective, you know, it's not leaving the solid surface and going to the liquid. You know, what do you think will happen? Say, you know, in region two, for example. Um, we deliver one megawatt per meter squared of energy. Now in region 3, we are trying to deliver 1.5 megawatt per meter squared of energy. Because now boiling is just, you know, we need to try and get more heat and now we're not getting any heat. If this energy doesn't transfer to the fluid, uh, it spends more and more time on the solid instead. And the excess temperature um, at the solid surface, of course, increases due to the increase of heat flux into the solid. Okay, and for water, this transition from effective heat transfer to a reduction in heat transfer occurs between the excess temperatures of about 30 degrees Celsius and 320 degrees Celsius. So that's a big difference. Form boiling occurs at quite high excess temperatures, all right, where the liquid is elevating above, um, you know, continuous uh, pocket of vapor, and this uh, vapor, of course, acts as an insulation, um, you know, layer between the the liquid and solid. So the onset of form boiling occurs at a point that is uh, referred to or known as the Leiden frost point. So this is shown here on the graph at the minimum. But even in the presence of this vapor, due to the high excess temperature at the solid surface, radiative heat transfer becomes more dominant over the convection. All right, so. Uh, we are obviously able to penetrate past the, the vapor cushion in terms of heat transfer. Um, now if we were if you were paying attention you would have started to realize the development of something like a feedback loop in terms of energy. I'm supplying more energy but it's not going anywhere. So the temperature is getting hotter on the surface, more vapor. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to achieve transition boiling um, with this, this loop, you know, the, the fluid is heating up, obviously, the gas is getting hotter, um, the surface is getting hotter, um, but it's actually very much more common that the boiling curve will follow the profile that is shown here instead in the green. As you increase the heat flux past the critical heat f um, uh, heat flux Q at the critical excess temperature, the heat is prevented from trans uh, transferring uh, fast enough to the liquid and instead remains behind in the solid. The solid quickly heats up as a response to the increase in heat flux and the temperature jumps suddenly to point E on the curve. 
Likewise, when you try and cool the fluid down from film boiling, um, this causes the excess temperature to jump from its minimum of region 3 and 4 right down to nucleate boiling region 2 as shown in the red. Uh, can you think why this would happen? Right. So the reason is that this is due to a sudden collapse of this uh, dissipation of the the well collapse and dissipation of that vapor pocket that we're talking about. So the vapor pocket suddenly collapses, all that energy goes in through the liquid, right? And suddenly, um, you know the so th the vapor pocket has you know a lot uh, a much lower heat flux available to heat the liquid and then suddenly the liquid replaces it all right so now the heat the the liquid can suddenly take up all the heat of the solid right so a very interesting question would be is it ever possible to follow the orange curve and I will let you ponder this and you can come up with your own conclusions maybe I'll ask you a, a question about that in a test so what is important to realize here is that most materials of construction cannot handle the excess temperature reached from the water um, from point E onwards. Okay, because as you heat, as you pumping in the energy into the solid, um, even though this temperature may seem very low for mo most metals, burnout can occur and can actually damage the equipment because you're not going to stay at this, um, you know, this point E. I mean, look at this T excess. It's 1,000 uh, plus the boiling point of water. So it's 1,000 plus 100 plus um, the the extra temperature. Um, so let's say this is 1,400, 1,500 degrees Celsius. Okay. Most of the metals of construction are not going to be able to handle this, and you're going to shoot past point E right you're not going to stay at point e you're going to shoot past uh, point e and go right to uh, 2000 degrees okay and most metals are just going to burn they're going to melt and uh, at this point you're going to get uh, burnout okay uh, for other liquids like oxygen and nitrogen obviously the incident of burnout is avoided due to the much lower boiling temperatures of the fluids and also the the lower melting temperatures of the materials of construction and operation at the maximum critical excess temperature uh, is fine. It's not optimum, but it's fine. Uh, the point C, therefore, is often referred to as the, uh, the burnout point and coincides with point E in this case. Okay, so just be very clear um, on, on understanding this principle. Um, now, of course, there are many uh, correlations available that can describe the boiling regimes. And by far the most important ones for us as chemical engineers um, are the, those equations which are used to describe the onset of peak boiling flux and the minimum uh, heat flux required for boiling. Okay, So nucleate boiling is the name of the game and it is described by the following equation which is also available in the textbook the various physical properties um, you know shown shown here uh, in this equation can be obtained uh, by the textbook or online or in Perry's uh, whatever reference material you have available to you you can find these so please note the mistake in the textbook that we use uh, for this equation uh, that describes the peak or critical heat flux um, it shows nu, which is the kinematic viscosity, um, but you should, uh, in any case, be able to confirm uh, that this is that this is wrong. Um, and how do you do? How do you do this confirmation? How do you pick up this mistake? Well, it's simple. Um, if you keep checking your units, the units are going to immediately tell you something is wrong with this equation. It shouldn't contain uh, nu. It should contain rho squared uh, v. Uh, it, it looks like a nu, but it's just referring to the vapor uh, density in this case. Okay. So as before, uh, we're also in, uh, you know, con 
interested or you know interested in determining what the convective heat transfer uh, is. Okay, so what is the convective heat transfer? Uh, obviously, it's going to change. So have a look at the following diagram. Uh, have a look at the diagram very carefully presented in the textbook and what is available online. Quickly Google it. Check that you come across the similar or the same diagram. Maybe it's in blue or orange. And can you tell the difference? So let's quickly discuss this uh, diagram, this figure, and let's figure it out. So just as with pool boiling, flow boiling has similar effects on uh, the resulting convective, uh, convective heat transfer coefficient. For bubbly flow, the convective heat transfer increases steadily due to increased convective uh, or convection that takes place. The convective heat transfer increases more distinctly in the case of uh, slug and annual annular flows, and once again decreases very sharply uh, with the onset of the vapor form uh, during mist and the forced convection flows that insulate uh, heat transfer to the fluid. So obviously when you have a vapor you have less heat transfer, so always remember this. It should be noted that um, you should understand this intuitively and not just learn this this graph um, you know parrot fashion as this graph is presented incorrectly in other resources and as a young chemical engineer um, you should be able to self-correct for these sorts of mistakes you will see mistakes like this um, the world isn't a perfect uh, you know place and you should just be comfortable and, and accept that mistakes happen um, and corrections should be ma made and um, if you are clever enough you should be able to pick this up no problem or just with a bit of effort you can figure it out. Now let's turn our attention to condensation. Okay, Now condensation occurs um, as two distinct types. The first is film condensation where a film of liquid covers the solid interface completely the liquid leaves the interface by gravity typically, so think of heat exchange equipment right in your mind's eye, uh, think about what this would look like. And the second case, the second type, occurs with the development of individual liquid droplets, which also leave the solid interface by gravity, but without the development of a liquid film. And so the question arises, which form of condensation do you think is better? And can you substantiate your answer? Would you prefer film boiling or dropwise? Oh, oh, film boiling. Film condensation or dropwise condensation. Here are the two cases again, and these are shown on some flat plates. Alright, so you don't have to have tubes, you can also have uh, plates, uh, different types of condensation uh, interfaces, solid, liquid, gas interface. Uh, it depends on if it's dropwise or film condensation. Let's look at the first type, uh, specifically film condensation. The flow of liquid is of course due to downwards forces due to gravity, but is also cumulative with respect to mass. This means that the film uh, thickness increases in the negative y direction as the film runs down the solid surface. Um, it should be uh, noted or it should be obvious that condensation occurs at the liquid gas interface and that heat transfer is from the vapor to the liquid and from the liquid to the solid. Okay, What are the temperatures for these interfaces? Uh, is the water temperature at, above, or below the saturation temperature of the fluid? What is the velocity uh, at the liquid-solid interface? Where is the maximum velocity to be located? Is this velocity change in the x direction, in the y direction? Uh, is there a point where velocity is, um, you know, zero? What about the flow regime? Uh, do we have laminar flow? Uh, what is the effect on the convective heat transfer coefficient? The local um, 
fluid regime, right? Maybe determined at the local Reynolds number, for example. Uh, but what do we use? Do we use the typical diameter? Is it a hydraulic diameter, etc.? So in the textbook, um, uh, it discusses this in much more detail for you. Um, but yeah, the first thing that we're going to consider are local fluid properties. Obviously, you can have an average as well for the nozzle number, for the convective heat transfer, etc. Uh, but the first thing that we would like to consider is the Reynolds number. It tells us uh, more information that we use to determine thermal properties. So uh, the hydraulic diameter, for instance, is defined in this case as four times the film thickness. And the properties of the fluid uh, we use at the film temperature. Remember, the film temperature is an average temperature. Okay, so when we talk about the fluid, we're talking about both liquid and gas in this case. Okay, so gases are also fluids. Now, with some sort of manipulation, uh, the equation we can rewrite as follows. Um, and also this equation is in the textbook. So if it confuses you, um, just go over the derivation in the textbook. Okay, so now we can consider heat transfer. The first step is considering the Reynolds number and then heat transfer. So as heat leaves the vapor, okay, it condenses at the saturation temperature at the liquid vapor interface. This heat likewise has to be absorbed okay, by the liquid and is transferred to the solid. Why is this? Well, obviously because we need a temperature gradient in order to transfer heat. No temperature gradient, no transferal of heat. What must be considered here is the capacity of which each of these phases can absorb heat. So, um, how this, you know, how, how is this going to affect uh, temperature, for example, for each of the phases? What is the heat capacity of the gas? What is the heat capacity of the liquid? And also, what is the heat capacity of the solid in question? Okay, the main parameter that governs this process is the latent heat of vaporization, of course, because that, that governs the condensation. So when we determine the heat transfer, we need to account for uh, this effect. And we do this by using a modified form of latent heat of vaporization, um, as shown uh, here. Okay. Now it should be noted that uh, the vapor itself is superheated. Uh, it could be close to saturation, obviously, but there should be a temperature gradient. So it should be superheated until it reaches the liquid vapor interface where it will be um, saturated. Okay. And uh, therefore, the vapor needs to be cooled from its uh, superheated temperature down to the saturation temperature. Now fortunately, um, you know, this is uh, easy to, to modify um, and how we do this is use the heat capacity for the, the vapor and we use this to modify the equation further uh, as shown here. So this is a, a a second modification that we've done to the latent heat of va uh, vaporization equation. This can then be used uh, in an energy balance where we equate the convective heat transfer uh, with the energy required for, for condensation using the modified uh, latent heat of vaporization. Now a further simplification that we can make is by incorporating that Reynolds number equation into this equation, the one that um, uh, we derived a few slides back. Okay, so we obtain the following equation and just keep in mind that these equations we now have derived um, are uh, to explain condensation and how condensation um, occurs but this only applies to film condensation in general. Okay, so for film condensation over flat plates, um, you know these uh, these equations are going to have to just be modified a little bit more. Okay, um, 
So for for flat plate uh, for flat plates, um, we can use the following equations uh, to determine the convective heat transfer coefficient, where there exists a large enough uh, difference between the vapor and liquid density. So just make sure what the requirements are first uh, when using these equations. Uh, we define the Reynolds number for this process by the following uh, relationship, uh, which we can then incorporate into the equation and then determine the convective heat transfer coefficient for vertical flat plates. Now again, all of these uh, equations can be found in the textbook, so if you are confused, you can go over how they were derived. There is more discussion, um, but I just want to give you an overview of how we can approach different um, aspects of condensation in terms of design. So if I have a flat plate, I would um, you know, have to have a certain equation, and which equation do I uh, decide upon. Um, but the equations that we've just discussed now uh, still apply for wavy free laminar flow. And Reynolds number is going to tell us um, what type of flow regimes we have. Um, but we cannot use, for example, the previous equations if we have wavy or turbulent flows. Uh, for these types of flows, we have uh, separate equations that um, should be used instead. Uh, for, uh, for example, when we have uh, uh, flows on an inclined plate, so we were talking about a vertical plate, uh, what happens if we have an incline? The following correlation is used to convert the uh, convective heat transfer coefficient that we have obtained for the vertical case that we can use instead on the inclined case. Okay, so this equation is also in the textbook. So lots of equations, you know, um, that you have to uh, go over. But just be sure you don't have to obviously learn these equations parrot fashion. They are in the textbook for you. Um, and just be sure that you you know where to find them and that you know. So so this lecture tells you that these equations exist and you know if you think okay uh, so for example you know if I have um, horizontal tubes for example uh, there's an equation for that so this is shown here um, where the the tubes uh, you know if they incline away from the horizontal position again we use a correlation uh, applied as shown and for spheres uh, the constant of uh, 0 0.729 is to be changed to 0 0.815 for this equation so you can use the same equation just make sure you change that constant the previous equations are only for single tubes and in the case of multiple tube banks in the horizontal formation, the following equations are used instead. Okay, and uh, the last part of the work uh, in terms of dropwise condensation, it's not a lot, um, but this is dedicated to a self-study exercise. Uh, but obviously, you should study this because it is tested and part of the outcomes uh, for CIO. And with that, uh, we end off uh, this lecture on boiling and condensation.